In lecture 14, we're going to start talking about manipulator singularities. Now, these are parts of the robot's workspace where the reachable set of velocities we can achieve loses dimension. So you can see this picture on the right, that ellipse there is the span of possible velocities that the end effector can move in at this point. And you can see it's a 3D ellipse. There are certain configurations where this goes from 3D into 2D or even 1D, and those are the singularities. So here is that 3D ellipse, and we can look at it and see that it is three-dimensional. As we move this robot around, the shape of this changes. So I'm going to lift this arm upwards, and what we can see is that it's starting to get thinner and thinner. So it's thin in this dimension, so I'm going to focus on this dimension as I go through here. I'm going to bring this up there. We'll bring this back. You can see it gets very thin in this dimension. And now we're going to go just a little bit farther. And there, it has disappeared. We can do worse than that. For instance, if we straighten this back out, but then point straight up. And so here you see that it has gone from being three dimensional. to being a single dimension. And that's because, well, first off, if I move the red joint, the red joint just rotates that point there. It doesn't change our velocity of the end effector at all. Whereas the green one, immediately, if I rotate this, it's only going to move the tip back and forth along the blue arrow. If I move the blue joint, it's also only going to move it along the blue arrow. So today we're going to talk about how do we find where these singularities are and why do they matter? Singularities are caused by the inverse kinematics of the robot. When placed at a singularity, there may be an infinite number of ways for the kinematics to achieve the same tip position of the robot. If the optimal solution is not chosen, assuming there is one, the robot joints could be commanded to move in an impossible way. Infinite velocity is not the only type of singularity that causes problems, and certain types of singularities can be more problematic than others. Some robots can be put in such a bad position that they need to be turned off, moved, and restarted again. This singularity is sometimes called the ballerina configuration because it holds the wrist center in exactly the same position as the robot is moving along. One of the dangers about this configuration is if you have a velocity that moves through this singularity, instantaneously there's no solution and the robot has to reconfigure itself. Such motion could be very dangerous if you had a painting robot or a welding robot or a surgical robot holding a scalpel. Another one we have is at the boundary of the workspace. When we extend our arm all the way out, it suddenly becomes impossible to push the arm any farther. And so you see the interior robot giving up. Here's an example of welding. As you can imagine, if we hit that singular position in the middle, then you could have a burn through event where your welder stops moving. Even worse would be a picture of a surgery. And I found some videos online of that, and I chickened out. So instead, here you get a video of welding, and you can imagine how it would be bad if we stopped in the middle of it. These video clips are from a universal robot, and I like them because my lab has a universal robot, and also because the kinematics of the, ro of the UR robot have some of the joints offset. And so these singularities appear in different places. We can find these singularities often if you're moving the robot and suddenly it does something strange when you're trying to move in a straight line. So here it's actually passing through a singular configuration and it cannot instantaneously move along that velocity. Here in slow motion you can see as it hits that point it's trying to move in a velocity and then if you're trying to do constant velocity it can't. And so what you can do is you can hold up in that singular position and then you can do some interesting motion where you're moving the whole robot but the tip is not moving at all. These are often used in trade shows because they look so cool. Here's a shoulder singularity as we move through there. 
it's trying to maintain a constant velocity, but it can't. In that position, it has to spin around. And so that is a position where you can move a bunch of joints of the robot and get no motion at all of the robot. If you tried to do a constant velocity through there, then the robot would give up and you get an air. The elbow singularity is very similar to the other robot. If you're trying to extend out there, suddenly to maintain that same velocity, you're going to need more and more effort from your motors. And so the robot hits a limit and then ours is programmed because it's a cobot, it's supposed to work with people. It'll just give up if it can't supply the required force. So here is a one degree of freedom manipulator. It's a revolute joint, so as we move this revolute joint, it slides along in that slot in the brown member, and it generates a velocity in the x direction of this brown thing. And so I like this example because it's the simplest example I can have of a singularity. So what these different plots on the right are, if I move back to zero, you see this red dot here is moving in theta one, and as it moves, it can generate a velocity of the end effector. And the relationship of that is a matrix called the Jacobian. So in this case, the Jacobian is just going to be the negative sine of the current angle times theta one dot. And so one of the things you can notice is that there's certain places where it's easy to achieve a velocity. Right here, we can't achieve much velocity. In fact, the velocity is this dot here. But if we go down to pi over two, suddenly, we have a lot of power, we can easily create velocities. So if we hold theta one constant and we multiply it by our negative sine of theta, then we can get our output velocity is large. And we can choose to make this theta one go in either direction so we can get a plus or minus x velocity very easily. However, as soon as we go close to these singular positions, then it becomes harder and harder to achieve a velocity. In fact, when we get over here, suddenly we can't achieve a velocity anymore. We're at zero. Now the more interesting thing is to look at the inverse of that relationship. The inverse of the relationship says, hey, I want to move at a certain velocity. In this case, I want my linear in the x velocity to be one, and I multiply it by the inverse of my Jacobian, and I get how fast do I have to move the motor in order to achieve that. And these are when the singularities are. Because if this Jacobian ever hits a spot where it is zero, then there's no velocity in the world that we can move the motor by in order to achieve the desired velocity in the output. And so you can see that we're hitting this singularity as the required motor effort goes to infinity. So I'm going to play that through there and you can watch as this red dot goes around. And you can see these singularities as we hit them. And these singularities are suddenly when, because we have a real robot, there is a limit to how fast we can move those joints. And so at the singularity, there's no way that we could achieve infinite input. And so the robot program is going to fail. The robot will do something unexpected. There's going to be a problem in your program. And so if you have to control these velocities, you need to make sure that you steer the robot to avoid these singular positions. If you desire to have a bounded output, you require an unbounded input. That is the singularity. And that's what we're going to study today. So remember, what the Jacobian does, it tells us how fast should our motors go to get our desired speed at our end effector. So we've got this six by n Jacobian because we've got n joints in a robot, our n degrees of freedom, and we get a Jacobian for each of our configuration, which the configuration, remember, is Q, and so our Jacobian of Q is a six by n matrix, and it defines the mapping that tells you how do I get from how fast the motors are moving to how fast the end effector is moving. So this red psi is a vector of our linear velocities and our angular velocities. And all possible psi's that we can achieve are linear combinations of columns of this Jacobian J. So we can split that J into column one, column two, all the way to column N. And each of these columns is just being multiplied by how fast that paired motor is going. When we talk about what are the achievable velocities, we're really asking is if this matrix J has an inverse. So it's important that we take a step back and remind ourselves of some linear algebra. Remember, a square matrix A has an inverse if and only if, can you supply it? If and only if, it's a key term in linear algebra, it all comes down to the determinant. 
you have an inverse as long as this determinant of a is not equal to zero. This is very easy to see in the one do case because we can't take a one over zero. The inverse of zero doesn't exist. So the same thing happens in a matrix. If we have a determinant that is zero, we have a divide by zero error and we cannot inverse that matrix. And so now let's switch over to your worksheet. So the square matrix A has an inverse if and only if the determinant determinant of A is not equal to zero. And so let's say that we have a two by two A. So you've got A, B, C, D. A inverse is going to be one over the determinant of A multiplied by what's called the adjugate of A. Or sometimes they call this the adjoint. Now the adjoint of a square matrix is a transpose of what's called the cofactor matrix. Uh, and so we memorize these at one point. So the ad, this is equal to, well, we'll come back to the determinant, but what we need to do is get the adjoint. That's just going to be reverse this diagonal, and then we invert the other diagonal. And then our determinant of A, well remember our determinant of A is equal to AD minus BC. So we can write that in here, AD minus BC. And that's our answer. That's how we find the inverse of a two by two matrix. So it's worth doing some examples. I want you to pause the video and do this example yourself. Okay, hopefully you did pause that video. And so what we do is we take one divided by determinant, so three, six minus seven times nine, then do our cofactor expansion, and then we have to multiply this out. So we've got 18, that's minus 63. And so one divided by negative, well, 63 minus 18 is 45. And then we get our matrix, which we multiply out, and we get, oh, negative 2 fifteenths, and negative 1 fifteenth, 7 45ths, and 1 fifth. Now I want you to do the second example, this matrix B, find its inverse. So again, pause the video, work it out. So here we've got one over three times four minus two times six. And then the cofactor expansion here, we've got four, three, negative six, negative two, which is equal to one divided by 12 minus 12 times this. So we get one divided by zero times this. And so the answer does not exist because we can't divide by zero. So here is our two link planar manipulator. Remember we move R1 along this axis and we can spin that around with theta one. We move R2 along this axis that can be spun by theta two. We wanna find the Jacobian of that. And so since we've got two revolute joints, the bottom row is going to be what axis are they revolving around? So it's the, the first joint revolves around Z0, the second joint revolves around Z1. And then you take the cross product of the axis you rotate around and the vector arm from the end effector to that axis. So that's gonna be this line from theta one to theta two, whereas the second axis here is rotating from theta one to theta two. And so if we build out this Jacobian, there's only a few rows that we need. We need to have Z1, we also need to have our, what is our O1 that shows up in red here, and then we need to know where's O2. Our O0 is gonna be 0, 0, 0, and our Z0 is always 0, 0, 1. So then we can take those cross products and we can express and we can get our matrix J over here. This is a two by six matrix because we've got two motors, and then the six entries on the other side are what are going to be the linear velocities in X, Y, and Z, and what are going to be the angular velocities in roll, pitch, and yaw. So that's what it's going to be our psi output. This uh, J matrix that we have is a function of the current configuration. And since we're multiplying against two motors, not all of these rows are very interesting. In fact, we cannot generate a velocity in the Z direction out of the page. That row is not very interesting. We also can't do a roll or a pitch, all we can do is yaw. And since all we can do is yaw, that one also isn't so interesting. And so the interesting entries of this Jacobian are going to be the top two. What are the velocities we can do in X and Y? 
and that gives us our, our velocities on the outside that we multiply by our, Jaco our Jacobian by how fast our joints move. If then we want to inverse this and figure out how fast should we make our joints move in order to achieve some arbitrary velocity, then we have to take the inverse of that. And again, you can't take the inverse of a 6 by 2 matrix, but you can take the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. And so if all we care about is the velocity in x and y, then we can take this 2 by 2 matrix and then we can try to take the inverse. So whenever this is invertible, then we can achieve an arbitrary arbitrary x and y velocities. And it'll tell us exactly how fast we should move our joints. But there's certain configurations q where that isn't possible. To do this, we have to figure out where this determinant is going to be 0. And that's so interesting, we're going to do that in paper. So let's look at that determinant. Determinant of uh, j22, we often write that as just this bar j22. To our first term first, we've got our negative r1 s1 minus r2 s1 2 times r2 c1 2, and we've got a minus our minus r2 s1 2. That's multiplied by the quantity r1 c1 plus r2 c1 2. So let's multiply that out, and we get negative r1 r2 2 s1 c1 2 minus r2 squared s1 2 c1 2 minus minus up we get plus r1 r2 c1 s1 2 plus r2 squared c1 2 s1 2. Well fortunately we have some cancellations and so this term here and this term here and so now let's see if we can simplify the rest a little bit. So this is going to equal, I'm going to pull out my r1, r2. And I've got c1, s1, 2 minus s1, c1, 2. So now I'm going to remember some of my terms from linear algebra. I can say that alpha is equal to theta 1 plus theta 2. I'm going to let beta is equal to theta 1. And then I remember that sine of a alpha minus beta is equal to sine of alpha cosine beta minus cos alpha sine beta. And that is exactly what I have here if I reverse the order of these two. And so then I get this is equal to r1 r2 times the sine of alpha minus beta is going to be theta 1 plus theta 2 minus theta 1 is equal just theta 2, sine of theta 2. And so that is where I have a problem on this robot, where it loses some degrees of freedom. So we are uninvertible when, so it is, does not exist when theta 2 is equal to 0 pi 2 pi or anything k times pi, where k is in the set of integers. And that is precisely why, as we move to the edge of this workspace, we lose a degree of freedom in our achievable velocity shown by this ellipse here. As we reach out there, it goes to zero, and also as we come back in towards the center, because that corresponds to theta 2 equals zero or pi. And just so that you know that that's true even if you have different lengths, lengths of your arm. So this is this arm with an oversized second link. As we get out straight, it goes back. So this is independent of what your R1 is. As we come here, we also lose that degree of freedom. Or we could have a big, long first link. And you get the same thing. So as we get to the outside, we lose that degree of freedom. As we come to the inside, we again lose that degree of freedom.